all you and they're here for this worship on this beautiful Sunday and also those that are watching online. So uh, first of all, I'm going to have you do is locate the red pew pads, sign your name. In there you will find the joys and concern slips and they will be picked up uh, during the opening hymn. Those online that are watching and worship, worshiping with us today, um, just put your comment in and that will be given to Pastor Brenda also. Our announcements for today is, uh, today is Pantry Refresh Day. And they're in need of uh, tuna, canned chicken, peanut butter, jelly, soups, that sort of thing. That is today if you can get it here. Monday, committee summary support reports are due, so all the committees take note of that. Quarterly commodities, 12 to 1.30 p.m. in the back parking lot. If you know anyone that is in need of those or signed up for them, let them know that time. Uh, the prayer group, they will meet on Thursday at 10 o'clock on the stage in the fellowship hall. Remember that next Sunday is uh, Communion Sunday. One other thing is hot topics. Hot topics are sermon requests or suggestions for Pastor Brenner to preach or expand on this summer. Blank slips of paper are available for your requests and suggestions near the designated jar in the narthex back there. Please provide your name so Pastor Brenda can reach you if she has questions. Requests sent electronically are welcomed also. So take note of that. Um, that is all I have. I think Pastor Brenda has something. I have a couple of things. Um, for one, uh, note that prayer group is open to anyone, and we are meeting Thursday at 10 this week, and unless we let you know otherwise. We've had some uh, conflicts with the times we've tried on Wednesday. We're going to try Thursday morning at 10 uh, and see how that goes. And also, want to kind of call your attention, if you haven't noticed already, the things that are on the side of the sanctuary over here, you might be able to see the table, even if you're uh, on this side. That is what we call a grace space. Uh, annual conference has been using a grace space in the area where we meet for several years now, and it's an area where our children can worship and do so through play, hopefully, quietly enough that uh, the adults can worship without uh, too much distraction, but um, it's a space that allows for the children to stay in worship with us in the sanctuary and express themselves in their own way. So some of the details may change, but we've got the little table for uh, some of the little bit older kids, and there's a rug over there uh, for some of the littlest ones, and toys that are appropriate for some of our younger kids. So um, kind of keep an eye on that and how it's used, and um, we'll hope that we have kids here soon to try it out. But I wanted you to know why that was there. And I think that's all I have. I invite you to stand if you're able for a call to worship. By gracious power so wonderfully sheltered, and confidently waiting, come what may. We know that God is with us night and morning, and never fails to greet us each day. Let us worship the living God. Let us now join together in opening hymn.
join together in our opening prayer. Eternal God, as we gather in this time and place, we are reminded of your mighty works amid the great drama of human history. We praise you for never giving up on us, for loving us with a love from which nothing can separate us. May we become more aware of your activity and presence, that we will see you more clearly at work in the midst of all the pain and joy of our lives. You may be seated. Children's message will need to be for the young at heart this morning. <laughs> As I don't see any who are who are on the younger end uh, chronologically. But I want to tell you a little bit of a story, and then I'll have a question. The story goes that a man went up in a hot air balloon. Unluckily, the man fell out of the balloon. Luckily, he had a parachute. Unluckily, the parachute didn't work. Luckily, there was a haystack below him. Unluckily, there was a pitchfork in the haystack. Luckily, he missed the pitchfork. Unluckily, he also missed the haystack. Ouch. <laughs> Rather ridiculous story, but the question is, was the man lucky or unlucky? And there were aspects of both throughout the story. In the end, he ended up the story with an unlucky event. Along the way, it was a little hard to tell whether he was lucky or not. That's often true in our lives, and it was certainly true for a man in the Bible named Joseph. And I'm not talking about Mary's uh, betrothed and then husband, but Joseph of the Old Testament, the son of Jacob. He had a lot of good and bad luck all through his life. But unlike the man who fell out of the hot air balloon, Joseph had God at work in his life, turning evil into good. God used Joseph to save a lot of people from starvation after he had the bad experience of being sold into slavery. So let us never give up because God is always with us turning evil into good in some wonderful and surprising ways. And let us give our thanks and praise for the wonderful ways that God works in our lives, and let us also share with God uh, those concerns that weigh heavily on us. I have one shared in writing, so blessed to have my church family. Today is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. For improvement in my hip. For Kristen Nanda Davis. Facing OR for heart surgery. Ann Leonard Ferguson had very successful neck surgery on Wednesday. Prayers for good outcome. And a praise for Carla and Jim Darling spent a morning helping us till the garden and cleaning up a flower bed for Ben and Sue Leonard. Also one for the family of Russ Hahn, who passed away on Wednesday. I also have um, two more. One is for my mom. Uh, she's not with us this morning. She woke up with pretty severe shortness of breath. Uh, she's been having some leg and ankle swelling and um, some shortness of breath that, that accompanies that sometimes and the change in barometer and such is not helping. So um, she is home this morning. So prayers while they figure out what's at the heart of the issue. And also, I received a call from Anna Marie Lubert last night that her brother Rob Loomis spent yesterday in the hospital. He has a heart concern as well as some other issues. He is home and will be wearing a monitor for a 
few days to see Rob and his family in the church. And let's pray together. God of grace and glory, we do thank you for this day and for this hour when we can come together to worship and to praise, to spend time in fellowship, to lift our prayers of joy as well as those prayers of concern before you, knowing that you are already responding to the needs. We are blessed to have a generous supportive church family and we do celebrate each day that you give us we thank you for your healing presence that's already being experienced by some that some are praying for as they seek answers to health issues as they begin journeys of healing and treatment and answer questions we thank you for successful surgeries and for the opportunity we have to have surgeries and medications that help our bodies to work more effectively, more in more healthy ways. And Lord, we do thank you for friends and for family who worship with us, who help to meet needs when they come about at our homes, in our church buildings, in our community. And Lord, your healing presence means so much to those who are grieving. And so as we lift the family of Russ Kahn and those others who are on our hearts and minds this day who have passed, who have come to their eternal home from this earthly home, we ask that you make your presence known to their families their friends who are grieving, that they might experience your healing touch. And Lord, for all of these needs that get closest to home and are shared with the church family, we know there are more on hearts and minds. We ask that you would give assurance and peace that you are at work in those situations as well. And there are needs around the community, around the country, around the world, in your church at large, where your peace and comfort, wisdom and strength are needed, so that people can do the work to which you have called us, and so that people may come to know you. And we ask your presence as it is needed in all of those situations. All of this we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. I would be my name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
scripture for this morning does come from Genesis 50, verses 15 to 21. That is part of a much longer story, so let me introduce that scripture. Joseph was the 11th of Jacob's 12 sons from the Old Testament. Jacob's favorite son. According to the story told in Genesis chapters 35 to 50, Joseph seemed to his brothers as though he had everything, and he influenced his father to get whatever he wanted. Jacob had given Joseph what we know as the coat of many colors, it's sometimes referred to as a robe, that was a sign of wealth and status, of all things, because it had long sleeves. That was not common, so the long sleeves gave it, um, made it a sign of something special. The brothers had heard Joseph boast about his dreams, that he would one day rule over them. These are literal dreams he's having at night, that he would rule over them. The jealous brothers had had enough of the spoiled father's pet, as we may call him. They conspired to kill Joseph, throw him into a pit, and lie that a wild animal had devoured him. He had it coming in their estimation. Fortunately, one of the brothers talked some sense into the others, convincing them not to take Joseph's life, but instead they threw him into the pit alive and sold him into slavery. They smeared his colorful robe or coat with goat's blood and showed it to their father, telling him that Joseph had been torn to pieces by wild animals. In reality, Joseph had been hauled off to Egypt, where he became a slave of one of Pharaoh's officers. Fast forward to the end of Genesis, chapter 50. Joseph has risen to power and is now second in command to Pharaoh. A famine hits Canaan, Joseph's hometown, where his father and brothers still live. The brothers traveled to Egypt to buy grain, not realizing that Joseph was now the governor in the land. And Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers, and then we begin with chapter 50, verse 15, where we read, Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you before the... I beg you forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of God for the people of God. So today I'm addressing the first of the hot topics. You've seen those announced over the last couple weeks. That's, I'm giving you the opportunity to tell me what you would like for me to preach on. If you have a question, if you have a scripture you'd like to know more about, if you have a topic that you'd simply like to understand better, put your um, suggestion in the jar outside the sanctuary or get it to me electronically. And I'd be glad to do that. So this first hot topic, someone asked, is karma real? So the basic answer from a Christian standpoint is that karma in its full original definition is not real within Christian teaching. On the other hand, feelings of guilt, shame, fear, anger, and a need for justice feel very real to people at times. And there are some biblical truths that speak to guilt, etc. 
that shares some themes with karma as we've come to understand karma, and I will describe that in a moment. So let's define karma, look at the similar biblical truths, and then talk about what action steps we might take because of how God's word responds to our needs. So first, the definition of karma. Karma is actually from the Hindu and Buddhist traditions, and they, they believe in reincarnation. So there's something unique there about karma. They define it as the sum of a person's actions in this and previous states of existence. So those who believe in reincarnation consider karma a significant factor in deciding the fate of a person in a future existence. So this is oversimplified. But basically, if you have done good in this life and previous ones, you'll build up positive karma and be reincarnated as someone or something much more pleasant and desirable than if you've done harm in this life and built up negative karma. Okay, so that's the idea of karma itself. Since karma is associated with the, the idea of reincarnation, we can't say we teach karma exactly but karma is associated with the concept that every thought and action has a corresponding reaction. The idea that there are consequences for what we do. And one of those might be a selfless action uplifts a soul, while a selfish one degrades it. So again, consequences for what we do. So outside of traditions who believe in reincarnation. I hear the term karma used to refer to consequences, paybacks, rewards, or punishment for what people do. And again, since we don't teach reincarnation, we don't teach the doctrine of karma per se. However, some biblical teachings in Joseph's story that I've shared with you this morning and in others seem similar to karma. For example, the Bible teaches that Again, our, our actions do have consequences. The Bible also teaches, though, that God is for us and works for our good. So from the garden in Genesis to John's vision in the book of Revelation, Scripture tells us that our actions do have consequences. God gives people commands to live by, and in some cases, God specifies blessings, and negative consequences for obedience or disobedience. Proverbs 2.8 makes the general statement that whoever sows injustice will reap calamity, and the rod of anger will fail. What we do to harm others generally ends up bringing some kind of hurt to us in return. The consequences we face can come immediately, or they can have eternal spiritual effects. They can come naturally, like bodily injuries from fighting or wrecking a vehicle, or they can be enforced by an authority. If we break the law, we face fines or jail time or maybe community service. If we rebel against God and others, we find our relationships broken. If we try to live by our own power instead of God, we find ourselves stressed and worried and sometimes sick with high blood pressure, heartburn, lack of sleep. Using the parable of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, Jesus reminds us that even the little things we do for someone in need reflect the ways we respond to God, and even those little things can have eternal consequences. What you've done to the least of these, Jesus says, you've done to me. And those who have done justly and those who have not will be sorted out in the end. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 both describe God as one who visits the sins of the fathers on the children for three to four generations. That's a tough passage to work with because it makes it sound like God is going to punish the great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren 
for their great-great-grandparents' sins. But let's not look at it that way. I read God's word, not as a warning of punishment doled out to the children four generations after the sin has occurred, but as a warning about the patterns that develop over time in a family. If a parent abuses their child, for example, the children tend to either become abusers themselves or be attracted to abusers as adults, which can lead then to grandchildren being abused and great-grandchildren being abused and so on until somebody finds the strength, the training, the resources they need to break the cycle. And you might know some people who have been that one to break the cycle. So it's true that our sins can lead to negative consequences. Joseph's story illustrates another Christian teaching that we call providence. The idea that God is for us and works for our good. Joseph's brothers had threatened him. But his father, who loved him, believed that he was dead, and they sold him into slavery where he could have been harmed. When they saw Joseph in Egypt years later and received from him the food they needed to get through the famine in their land, they expected to pay for all that they had done to Joseph by becoming his slave. Instead, Joseph forgave them and continued to provide for them. Joseph recognized that even though his brothers had intended to harm him, God had used his time in Egypt to help him grow in faith and power, using what they had intended for evil for good purposes. Joseph and his brothers became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. We see the people of Israel face consequences for their sins throughout the Old Testament. Forty years in the wilderness was quite the time out for that community, that nation of Israel. But God showed grace and forgiveness to the brothers through Joseph in those days in Egypt. Similarly, Jews in Jesus' day, including the disciples, believed that birth defects and disabilities were punishments for sin. But that's not what Jesus teaches. Yes, some of our actions can naturally cause some health and mobility problems. But in John 9, 2, when Jesus encountered a man born blind, and the disciples asked, who sinned that this man was born blind? Jesus assured them that the man was not born blind as a punishment for anyone's sins. God's power would be made known through the man's limitations. And Jesus proved his point by healing the man and allowing him to see. So our actions have consequences, and God is for us, working for our good. I witnessed an occasion where a family wrestled with the question in modern times of consequences for human action versus the hope of God using time of grief and trial for good while I served as an on-call hospital chaplain. My pager alerted me that I was needed in the ER. A young couple came and the man's parents came with them with a baby who had tragically died of suffocation. The dad had laid with the baby on the couch with the baby on his chest. And both dad and baby fell asleep. Either the dad turned over toward the back of the couch or the baby rolled off. I'm not sure which, but one way or the other, the baby was caught between him and the back of the couch. So this was a total accident. Absolutely no blame to be had. So they came into the emergency room, 
And of course, the dad's feelings of guilt were threatening to crush him. He went into a small room to spend a little time by himself while I was visiting with the rest of the family who was there, his wife and his parents. During that visit, or actually I don't know that I was even directly talking to them, but I heard the dad's mother say, maybe this happened to get him to quit drinking. And I shuddered, as I see some of you doing too. I shuddered at the thought of God taking the life of the baby to teach dad a lesson or to punish him for something that wasn't the healthiest choice in his life. I was thankful that he had not heard what she said because he was facing more than enough guilt for all that had happened already. On the other hand, if we think about it, with prayer, if she had simply phrased it somewhat differently, I might have seen some hope in what she could have claimed. The man was grieving, as any of us would, and then some, because what had happened had happened at his hands, even though it was a total accident. And by the way, he had not been drinking, so there was no direct connection with, it wasn't like he had been drinking and passed out when this happened. It was, it was total accident. He had not been drinking when this happened. But in their grief, just like Joseph being in slavery in Egypt was a bad thing, it, it was not a great situation, but God used it for his good and for the good of a lot of other people because with his position, he was able to help save a lot of people from the famine that was occurring in the area. And much like that, with prayer, I could see God using that time of grief and trial in this young dad's life to help him make healthy decisions, to help him grow maybe to help him grow closer to God than he had been. There's also the danger of if the guilt wasn't addressed with prayer and some help, there was the danger that it would even get worse. But with prayer and with that relationship with God, God could use the, the time of grief for the good of that dad and other people along the way. So we need to keep feelings of guilt as well as anger at others and fear in perspective. We all sometimes do wrong and we feel justified guilt. Guilt is a natural feeling when we grieve. And it's not unusual to feel guilty for a time when disability injury or illness or other kinds of harm happen in our families. We haven't always done right. We weren't there to help. Maybe God is punishing us for our families, us and our families, for what we've done. I hope you've been reassured that God is for us and that by grace and forgiveness, God works for our good. Because God forgives us, let us be open to forgiving others. Fear in the sense of respect for God is appropriate always. To be respectful of what God wants and to, to know of his strength and power. But fear of God doing harm in our lives because of something we've done is unnecessary for those who love him. If we feel guilty and afraid of what the results of our wrongdoing might be, let us pray about whether the guilt is justified. In some cases it is. In the example I gave of the father, 
in the example of Joseph's brothers, their guilt was justified. They had done wrong. And they expected to pay for it in ways that they didn't end up having to. In the sense of the young father, the guilt was natural under the circumstances. I can't imagine that any of us wouldn't feel the same way. But it wasn't justified in the sense of him feeling guilty over something he had actually done wrong. But let us pray to have God help us understand whether our guilt is justified. Did we actually do wrong? If so, let us apologize to any person involved. Let us confess to God. Repent, which means change your mind, change what you're doing, turn around. And let us do all we can to make the situation better. That guilt, as I said, is not always justified. It's not always because of something we've done wrong. When you pray, if you're not aware of anything that you've really done wrong, but that sense of guilt is there anyway, pray that God would show you the truth so that if there is wrong in your heart, it can be brought to light and addressed. But where you haven't done wrong, Ask God to give you peace. And with prayer, with time, with you working on your relationship with God, God will give you peace so that you can forgive yourself. When you're angry with someone else, and it happens, and sometimes it's because they've done something wrong and they've hurt you, Sometimes, maybe it's misunderstanding or something more simple. But when you're angry, pray and let God give you peace to replace the anger. Look for the ways that God has worked good where harm was intended. Put the actions of others in the past where they occurred, so your heart has room to receive the healing that God has to offer you. Yes, we need to choose our actions with grace and with wisdom. We need to learn from any consequences we face. And along the way, praise God that his grace can overcome God of grace, we thank you for your justice and for your mercy in dealing with us. We have done wrong. We have ignored your word, your nudging, the needs of your people. We thank you for working justice in our world and in our lives. We thank you for showing mercy, for we don't always face the consequences that maybe we deserve. And we can find ourselves frustrated when others have done wrong and they don't seem to face the consequences that we think they deserve. We thank you that by your mercy, you are on our side and will work for our good. Help us to live our lives on your side, working for your, the good of your people and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Come that time when we share our tithes and offerings for the morning. And so I'll ask the ushers to come forward, give as you feel called, knowing that what you give goes for the work of God and not of man.
your work, for your glory, for your people. Use them for good. Use them as the resources someone needs to get past whatever hurts are in their lives, to find your grace and your help. Amen. Thank you. 